I uh, I'm going to talk today about the Koopman operator theory, but uh, you know some of my focus is going to be on its use in learning because I, I think it's fair to say that it emerged as uh, as one of the principal candidates for uh, learning of dynamical learning of dynamical systems and dynamical behaviors, and I, I, I'd like to you know point out uh, elements why and then give you some uh, idea of what success can be achieved uh, in that context. So uh, I'll talk, this is the plan, I'll talk about the, uh, a little bit of history and modern use. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about learning of dynamical systems and its objectives to kind of set the stage and, 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 and point out why Koopman operator theory would be a good candidate for, for a framework. Uh, then I'll propose a um, a what I think is a new concept, and that's a concept of representations. It, it has close connections with representations in 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 group theory, uh, very close. But in this case, it's in the dynamical systems uh, realm, and uh, it, it it tells us some basic things about um, how can we represent dynamical systems. Namely, it tells us very in a very precise, rigorous way. Uh, whether a, a given nonlinear system might be represented linearly uh, in in particular spatial observables and 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 vice and, and and vice versa, it gives us conditions under which it cannot be represented linearly and it indeed needs a nonlinear representation. So it, that that's probably the major new thing, although it's already published um, in a paper, but uh, but maybe it's the one that if people are familiar with Koopman operator theory haven't heard, of as much, and I, I do consider it an interesting mathematical um, uh, uh, piece of work. Then I'll talk about numerical analysis. Um, I'll speak a, a little bit about robustness to noise and, and whether you can avoid overfitting with this methodology. I mean, any machine learning methodology is, uh, is suffering usually from this problem, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I'll spend some time discussing uh, how we port this to the realm of control that the founders like Koopman and von Neumann uh, certainly didn't do, and then talk about place of Koopman operator theory in AI, uh, Koopman operator for algorithms, and, and Koopman operator in, uh, in um, uh, soft robotics are, are, are going to be some of the applications. I mean, uh, the application to neural networks is an interesting one, I think, today, because not only that it's a parallel machine learning development, but uh, but it can also be used to analyze neural networks in the way I'm going to show you. Um, and so uh, those are some of the modern, more modern applications uh, and that, that that are kind of um, uh, of some of some interest. In the theory of representations, the key is going to be understanding of invariant subspecies of the Koopman operator. Uh, classically, the, the operators were used to study measure preserving systems. This is Koopman and, and von Neumann. For dissipative systems, a mathematical um, community called it by its name of a composition operator. And if you look at the work in the last 20, 30 years, it's, it's been really uh, on dissipative systems. So systems that are of uh, massive importance, obviously, in, in, in engineering. So, a, um, an elevator pitch is spectral objects associated with a class of linear representations help unravel the state space geometry and enable model reduction and control in, in high dimensional systems. But one thing that I will uh, point out repeatedly is this first part of that sentence, spectral objects, because we, we, we certainly hear and use these days lifting a lot. So lifting from, from state space to observable space. But in, in my point of view, uh, without the spectral, spectral analysis, we are missing some of, the key, some of the key aspects of the problem. And also I'll try to show you how useful the spectral analysis really is in this context. All right, so um, the current themes are really applications in learning and AI, learning, with minimal supervision or completely unsupervised learning. It turns out that Koopman operators are quite good in learning with relatively small amounts of data. And I'll, 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 I'll present a table that gives you kind of a, a feel for, for that. Uh, this is in contrast, of course. Oh, I should point out that 
the models based on these operators are always generative. <laughs> So, uh, so you know, uh, if you think about generative models uh, uh, like ChatGPT that has 175 billion parameters, uh, the properties of the Koopman operator framework allow you to do things with way smaller uh, representation space. Um, then uh, control and contextual adaptation. So learning, the, learning adaptively, learning from a small number of samples. These are all kinds of things that are not accessible with some other types of uh, learning frameworks, but are certainly, or, or at least have not been developed yet uh, sufficiently for some other types of learning frameworks, but but that are available here. Uh, there are some technical items. Uh, they, in, when, when one works with a coupon operator, one needs to select a function space, just like we always do. So the feature space um, in, in this particular context is an important thing. Uh, we need to talk about robustness to noise, about overfitting, uh, one of the interesting things in this context is that classically, again, the uh, prediction theory was typically done in a stationary um, uh, context. So if you look at the classical works of Kolmogorov, Wiener, you know, that, that, that standard theory, that's really a stationary prediction context. If you think about dynamical systems per se, right away, you kind of figure out, well, this is a class of systems, dynam dynamical systems, that has non-stationary behavior that is quite important to us in, in dynamical systems and control. And, um, and uh, what, I'll, what I'll point out is that the coupon the operator theory enables extension of these ideas to uh, non-stationary prediction. And I'll talk briefly about a really interesting and deep problem, mathematical problem, which is our systems with the same spectrum equivalent. If I have some time, if I have some time at the end, I will I will get to I will get to that as well. So I'd like to set a stage uh, by by setting up uh, the context. What are we interested in? Your learning model. Well, it, we'd like to provide a model uh, of a system directly from data, quantification of uncertainty methodology for control, enable analysis of a system behavior, for example, things like reconstruction and validation, model reduction. So if we, if we can get away with a small percentage of the original states in the system, enable prediction. And then the last two are kind of interesting and, and probably something that we should be concentrating on in, in conjunction with things like Pearl's um, causality theory, because it is true that these methodologies enable uh, causality analysis and what if analysis, but I, I won't uh, speak about that uh, today, except in, if in the discussion time we, we, we get into that, uh, we get into that a little bit. So uh, let me go through a couple of technical preliminaries. The key idea here is that one has a, 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 what was classically called a phase space. So this is a, a, a bit of history where uh, that, that Koopman and, and von Neumann I did Koopman first. Uh, M is our phase space in control. We'd call it state space. And this can be a, really in, in, in uh, Koopman operator, this could be a pretty arbitrary space. The only requirement on it is that, that it has a, uh, that, that it's a measure space. So you, it has a, some kind of measure defined on it. And you can really do a lot of what I'll be talking about in that context. And so uh, it, it, it ports standard dynamical systems ideas to uh, hybrid systems to very, very strange combinations of discrete and continuous. All of this can actually be handled. There is no smoothness requirement to start with. Um, the operator itself is defined as follows. So you have a function f on a state, x is an element of the, of the, of the is a state. So you combine f with a mapping t in the discrete time to obtain a new function, uh, which is then the action of the operator u that maps an observable space into itself on f. So you take f, you compose it with t, you obtain a new function. That's the key idea. Um, very, very simple. Uh, very, very simple, but I'm hopefully going to um, validate that it's also quite quite powerful. Uh, in continuous time, if we have a flow named st, t is the time, then we do the same thing. But now we have a family of operators ut that map observable space to itself uh, for every t element of r. 
It turns out that if the system is autonomous, then this has a group structure. I will uh, not speak too much about it, but, but you will see almost immediately, right? That if I have two functions, F1 and F2, because, com because composition uh, distributes over addition, that this is a linear operator. So T can be as nonlinear as we want, but U is linear. And so in, in, in standard speak, we are lifting the action of, of T, which might be nonlinear, to a linear, albeit infinite dimensional operator if the space of observables is, is infinite dimensional. So some Hilbert space, for example. I'm not stating it here, but I will do that uh, as we go. So um, that's the core, that's the core um, definition. Now, if we are in the smooth context, then if, let's say that you have a vector field, x dot is f of x, then, and I added a control here as well, then the generator of that evolution ut would be the right-hand side of this equation, which tells you the evolution of a function f, the observable, in time, and this is easily recognizable if any of you have uh, worked in, in stochastic control. Of course, it would have an additional term that is, a, that is a Laplacian. And by the way, yes, the ideas actually do port quite well to the stochastic case as well. You have to put an expectation operator in front of this in order to port it to the stochastic case. And that's something that my group, uh, 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 my student Matthias Manner is, is right now doing quite a bit of work on, uh, but I, I won't talk about stochasticity too much, much today. And then if you have a generator of the evolution, then you can ask for eigenvalues, lambda and eigenfunctions phi. So this is really phi dot, it's, it's the change of my function phi in the direction of the vector field f. And by the way, can you see my cursor? Okay, great. Yeah. So this is phi dot is lambda phi, right? Obviously that's a linear equation in itself. So if you find a phi, which is an eigenfunction of ut, well, it's an eigenfunction of the generator. So and, and it's nice and smooth. So in, in the correct space is an eigenfunction of ut as well. Uh, then it's just phi dot is lambda phi is that equation. And on the ut side is ut phi. If you integrate that equation, that's e to the lambda t phi. So basically this equation here, which tells you that phi is an eigenfunction if it satisfies this equation. So ut phi is e to the lambda t phi. That is just the integral of the generator equation. So that's what happens in the smooth case. As I pointed out, the restrictions to smooth is not necessary. And I like to work at the operator level exactly for this reason. So uh, it's, it's just to kind of represent what happens in the, in the, in the, in the, in the smooth case. All right. So the, the first observations in this context, um, and, and for me, this was way, way back, uh, back in my thesis, is that the geomet uh, geometry of level sets of Koopman eigenfunctions in state space is actually revealed by, uh, sorry, geometry of, le of level sets of Koopman eigenfunction in state space reveals the geometry of the dynamical system. That's an interesting, that's an interesting observation. Let me give you an immediate intuitive sense of this. Suppose that I have an equation phi dot is equal to zero. So f dot grad phi is equal to zero. That means that phi is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda. So phi is non-trivial. So do we know functions like this? Sure. If I have a mechanical system and I'm considering energy or a mechanical system with no friction, then energy is going to satisfy that equation. E dot is equal to zero. So voila, um, the energy of a Hamiltonian system is in fact an eigenfunction of the associated Koopman operator. That should give us a warm and cozy feeling that there is something here and that maybe other, other lambdas contain physical information about the system as well. It was certainly attractive as a property you know, to me. I thought, oh, I can find maybe all the invariants of a dynamical system using this observation. And indeed, that's, that's what I pursued. 
today, the concept of coupon modes is popular. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. These are projections of observables and coupon eigenfunctions. So they are very closely associated with coupon eigenfunctions. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So here is a, a general uh, uh, proposition that tells you that there is more than just energy in it. So this is basically telling you that if I find a Koopman eigenfunction for a, a continuous time system, then the level sets of that Koopman eigenfunction are in fact forming an invariant partition. So level sets of energy form an invariant partition. If you start in a level set of energy, you stay in it. It turns out that every Koopman eigenfunction, no matter what lambda the eigenvalue is, gives you the same property. So we can use this in chaotic systems. This is the famous standard map where you have a planar pendulum kicked by a, uh, kicked by a, uh, by a periodic kicks. And so famously it has, uh, this is a model by the way for in famous, uh, really well known in plasma physics for tokamaks and things of that sort. So from top to the bottom, you're seeing the, the action on, on the top. So you're seeing a, a, a um, momentum on the top and you're seeing the angle on the bottom. So if you see flat lines, that's strobosto stroboscopically plotted there. That means that the momentum is not changing. There is no effect on the system. And as you, as you kick the system, it starts developing these trajectories. What is plotted here is trajectories that don't keep constant momentum. And uh, down here, if you can see this, it's pretty small, but if you can see this, and maybe you can just trust me, you develop chaotic behavior in these zones. And so uh, things get quite messy. This is an associated Koopman eigenfunctions that is entirely produced from data. We chose an observable F and we have sampled it along the path. And then we have formed this time average and plotted it against the initial condition. And the, that is probably a, an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator. In fact, it's an invariant. So you can get energy this way, but you can get other invariants. Energy is actually not conserved in this system because you're kicking it. And, and if you contrast the left and the right, I think you're going to see some of the same features highlighted by, by the level sets. This is the Van der Poel oscillator. It famously has a limit cycle. And so there are two eigenfunctions of interest. They're obtained in, in a very similar way. You see, instead of time average, and this is a continuous time system, instead of time average, you multiply by some weight. Here it's an exponential weight. And uh, for all control theorists in the room, this looks like a Laplace as transform indeed, except for one over T in front. And if anybody remembers what Wiener did for generalized harmonic analysis, uh, it's, it's very, very similar. So instead of a simple integral uh, for periodogram, uh, he, it, it took uh, uh, some kind of a, an average over time. This turns out to be, again, this is F observable sampled over time on the trajectory multiplied by a weight, which is exponential with exponent lambda. If lambda is an eigenfunction, is an eigenvalue of the system, that gives you an eigenfunction. This is how the color here was produced. The limit cycle for this system is here. This is how the color was produced. The black lines are the true um, nonlinear phase lines. And you can see that basically they delineate the different colors. So again, you're getting an invariant partition. The system cycles around and a periodic in a periodic way. So this is how we can detect geometry from Koopman eigenfunctions. But let's go to, you know, what the most of the current use is about. <clears throat> a lot of it is about lifting. So we have some dynamical system, uh, point in state space is represented by P, and it's very intentionally abstract. So I'm, I'm, I'm not associating any numbers with it when I say P. And then there is P prime that gets ported to by the mapping T. But then I associate some observables to it. They could be Cartesian coordinates for, for some system. And I call that vector X. And then I have some nonlinear system X prime is T of X. Well, I can certainly expand X in some basis, provided that I have a nice Hilbert space of functions here. And let's call the coefficient Cj. 
Now I have a space of functions that I have lifted my P to, and the representation in the space of functions is certainly this infinite set of coefficients Cj. Now let's act with a coupon operator. As I said, it's linear. So let's act on it on an individual basis vector. We get, when it acts on Fj, we are going to expand that again into an infinite sum. So we're going to take all the basis vectors Fk and associate with them coefficients Djk. And now I'm going to act with u on x. So u is linear. So it's going to pass through act on fj. So I just need to include this here or, or replace this fj for u fj with this. And I get x prime. So the next state um, as the sum, double sum, over the original coefficients of x and djk and fks are the basis functions. In other words, uh, there are technical assumptions that go into this on spaces, but I have just represented my Koopman operator as an infinite set of coefficients d, j, k, right? So this is the Koopman matrix. And uh, now we're in business because we have a model. The good questions about this are, if we truncate this, how good is the model, right? That's an excellent question. And so we'll provide some answers next. For the answer, we need to talk about the uh, spectra and we need to talk. So I obtained the Koopman matrix. I would like to understand whether a finite truncation of it is any good for my representation, right? That's the question. So we need to go spectral. The, the key here is that we split the functions, <clears throat> the observables, as those that are non-zero on the attractor and those that are non-zero off the attractor. So there is a technical thing here that's going on. It's pretty general. The only thing that you need to go do is, is uh, uh, assume that the attractor itself is what is called the Milner attractor. I'm not going to go into. If you're interested in any details, here is a summary. This paper in American Mathematical Society notices summarizes it. Uh, there is a prior paper that uh, actually provided the result, but there is a there is a summary here, and it basically says the result says that you can represent this operator as a double integral over the spectral objects and projection um, operators. Okay, to to get some intuition behind this. So these Zs are the eigenvalues that, that correspond to off attractor dynamics. So the transient dynamics. These omegas are basically the frequencies. Think of it, if you have a limit cycle, it would be associated with the frequency frequencies. So not only the base frequency, but also the, also the harmonics, uh, if, if it's a nonlinear limit cycle, um, also the harmonics. So for a large set of systems, and, and that's something I've, I've first done in this 2005 paper, you can split the operator acting on G, some field of observables. So uh, a, a Z here is just an index. If you have five spatial dimensions, it will go from one to five for each spatial dimension. If you have a fluid dynamics, then it would be Z would be really the, you know, the coordinates in the in the spatial field. X is a is a variable in state space. So for a very general set of systems, you can represent this action, this thing, as G star. This is the time average of the process. If you want to think about it in, in stochastic process terms, this is the time average. Of course, it's going to be different for every dimension that you have in your system. Then there is this sum over eigenvalues, lambda j's, phi j's. Phi j's are the eigenfunctions. They depend on state space. And s j's are the Koopman modes that were first defined here. So this is now called the Koopman mode decomposition. But it contains more than just the modes themselves. It contains this integral here that is the integral that 
appears when your system has continuous spectrum. So nonlinearities are very often going to lead to continuous spectrum. So for example, if you have a simple pendulum, you're going to have different frequencies for different energies. That's going to contribute to non-existence of eigenfunctions, but you're going to have a continuous distribution of eigenvalues. Chaotic systems are also going to have continuous spectrum. Yeah, so basically you have discrete part of the spectrum. This function here is an invariant. It is the part of the spectrum that corresponds to eigenvalue one in discrete systems, eigenvalue zero in continuous systems. So for example, energy is that kind of a term. This is the oscillating, growing, decaying modes. And if you look at these two terms and you go back to linear systems, if you have, if you have your uh, state, G being just your state variables, X1 to Xn, then this would be zero if your fixed point is at zero. And this would be your standard linear expansion. Sj's, the Koopman modes, would be the eigenvectors of the system. Phi j's are functions of initial conditions, and that's something that I discovered somewhere along the way, and it shocked me a little bit because, of course, as, as probably all of you, you know, I didn't know that there is any meaning to the coefficient c j in the expansion of linear systems, in you know, spectral expansion of linear systems, but that function that depends on initial conditions, that's precisely the corresponding Koopman eigenfunction. So hopefully this gives you another, another um, sort of background reason to, to, to believe that there is something interesting here. I would say K is finite in linear context. K is infinite in, um, in uh, nonlinear non context. So you can have an infinite number of terms here. All right, so a brief history of this is this got defined first in 2005. Peter Schmidt defined DMD without any of the Koopman stuff. And then Clancy Rowley and myself, when he was doing a sabbatical uh, here at UCSB, provided that connection between DMD and KMD and applied it to fluid flow. And then, and then uh, it was applied to many other contexts as well. So, um, so now that we have the spectral concept, and I have to just look just briefly at a time here. Okay. So now that we have the spectral concept, let me talk a little bit about the representation because I, I want to answer in this talk this question of, you know, uh, when are these representations? Um, finite, linear, nonlinear, and so on. So let me first define the concept. I'll, I'll <clears throat> start with the idea that I will be here asking a slightly different question. And this is why I pointed out at the beginning that usually this methodology is thought as, okay, you have a nonlinear system and you represent it as an infinite dimensional nonlinear, uh, uh, infinite dimensional linear operator. I'm going to ask a different question. And I'm going to say, every system has a linear, infinite dimensional operator associated with it. What are the cases in which I have a finite dimensional linear or nonlinear representation of that operator? It's turning the, the Koopman issue on its head in a sense, right? So I'm going to say the operator is the model. I might not know what the model is, but the operator is the model to start with. Is there a finite dimensional linear or nonlinear representation on a subspace that I can obtain uh, for that? So I'm going to call a finite dimensional representation a set of functions, little f, and a, and a mapping, capital F, such that when I act with you on the functions, I obtain the same result as if I act with the mapping f on the same set of functions. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you see this is really a non-trivial requirement, right? But let's talk about whether we already know about, even from this talk, whether we already know one such thing. So let's suppose that f is just one, little f is just one function, and it's phi. It's, it's an eigenfunction. And let's suppose that we have u phi 
is lambda phi. In that case, I have a representation. There is a mapping, capital F, would be exactly lambda times phi. It takes the function phi, it multiplies it by lambda, it's a linear. So if you find an eigenfunction, you found the representation. It's one dimensional and it's linear. So the dimension of the mapping is the dimension of the representation. In this case, I showed you one. If, by the way, F can be real or complex. I prefer to start with the complex set of functions. I'll show you an example next. So representation is linear if our mapping is linear. And then you have to ask, well, maybe you found one function like this. Is that faithful? Namely, if I have two points in state space, is then f of m equal to f of n? And conversely, I mean, that one is obvious. But conversely, if f of m is equal to f of n, is m equal to n, right? So is f injective? If it is, then you're in good shape. You can call the representation faithful, yeah? Because it separates points in the state space. And here is a nice little proposition. If you have two n-dimensional representations, then they are conjugate. If you start from a point G, act on it with H, and then apply the mapping, that's exactly the same, starting from G, acting little g, acting on it with its own mapping, and then using H. So two faithful n-dimensional representations are conjugate. This gives us some faith that the definitions are good, right? Uh, because if, the, if they were not, that would be a very, very bad thing. So here is an example. Let's say you have just a rotation on the torus by some angle omega one in one direction and angle omega two in the other direction. If you take Z one and Z two to be just E to the I theta one and E to the I theta two, so my thetas are going from zero to two pi, then you have a representation that is linear. You just multiply your first, your Z one by E to the I omega one, and you multiply Z two by E to the I omega two, and you're going to get a representation of this particular motion on the torus. I started in an abstract motion of the torus, and then I represented it. And it's a linear representation. We think of motions on the torus as nonlinear actions, right? It's not proceeding in a linear way, but I can have an, a, a linear representation of this. So what is the general case uh, of this? Let's define a space of observables such that um, uh, uh, functions that are constant on joint level sets of some set of functions f that's generating it. That's a linear subspace of, of the set of all observables. So to give you an example, you're in 2D, you have coordinates x and y as observables. And if you take x, x squared, x cubed, they are all, all these functions have level sets that are exactly the same as level sets of x. Right, So that would be in that function f. And so a subspace is generated by a finite set of functions. If it is the subspace containing all of the observables that depend, you know, that are, that are dependent on a, that finite set of functions. And that's the key to solve the problem as to, as to what kind of representations can you have. So here is, it ends up being a corollary, a finite dimensional invariant subspace of u, spanned by observables in a linear representation of dimension n is a span of generalized eigenfunctions. In other words, if there is, if, if there is a finite dimensional representation, it's spanned by eigenfunctions and vice versa. And that tells you that you get linear representations, finite dimensional linear representations of some nonlinear system, if and only if there is a discrete spectrum of the operator. It's a strict connection between the spectrum of the operator that tells you that there are eigenfunctions and this result. Now you can have, if you have an infinite dimensional invariant subspace that is generated by F, then you can have there a nonlinear representation. Like for example, for a pendulum, you have 
theta dot is equal to some constant minus, you know, some negative constant times sine theta. That's a nonlinear representation of that Koopman operator, Koopman operator associated with the pendulum. And that leads to a really interesting extension of the classical Eigen problem that says, find me a set of functions f, finite dimensional set of functions f, such that the action of u on f is some mapping, capital F, acting on that set of functions. Now, again, if you have this little f to be just phi, then u phi is lambda phi, the standard Eigen problem, is one solution to the representation Eigen problem. But this is a way more general requirement. And I call it the representation Eigen problem. So you have a linear finite dimensional representations, you're going to get something like this. And then you're going to be in the span of Eigen functions. If uh, you want to go to the world of deep learning, you could solve this problem by asking that action of u of on f, which is really the next set of data points. Remember, f is a composition. It takes you one step forward. So you say, let me represent my observables by a neural network and O and my mapping by neural network and F. And you have a simple minimization over, over this um, um, that, that you could use deep, deep learning for. Now, efficient algorithms for solving this are an open problem. We tried quite hard. I think Michael Banks might be in this, in this, uh, in this uh, in his talk, and he's done some really nice work on solving these kinds of problems. But again, for general dynamical systems, I think we need quite a bit more work on solving this. And so this is a little advertisement for this uh, for this particular um, uh, for this particular idea that that's an important important function important uh, equation um, to solve. All right, so let's do, uh, let's go through numerical uh, analysis now. How do we compute eigenfunctions? Right? If we find eigenfunctions, we have found the representation. So uh, one of them is called generalized Laplace analysis. If I take you back a little bit uh, to this right at the beginning, you will see that I found eigenfunctions in these problems, but just doing these sums, here, the weight on the sum, so I just evaluated the function over a trajectory, the weight of this sum was one. Here, the weight was e to the minus lambda t. That can be generalized. So I call this um, approach generalized Laplace analysis. What you do is you look at the spectrum and under the condition that you have simple eigenvalues of u uh, that are ordered, so lambda zero is bigger than lambda, bigger equal lambda one and so on. You first compute that average, weighted average for lambda zero. You subtract that from the data and then you do it again, but now with the weight uh, weighted with lambda one. Then you subtract again, you do it again. And the theorem says that in Banach spaces under certain conditions, you uh, you will get a Koopman eigenfunction of, or if you have many observables, you get the projection of uh, observable f onto eigenfunction, and that would be the Koopman mod. So um, I really like this method because it's connected to ergodic theory. <laughs> um, it is used way less than the next I'm going to show you next, although this one has very precise theorems behind it. There is, there is absolutely rigorous analysis of even convergence rates for this analysis. The difference between what I'm showing you here and what I'm showing you next is that in this approach, you would first need to find the eigenvalues themselves, which you can do using a separate method and then compute these, these sums. In the approach that the field is currently using generally. Remember the Koopman matrix? It, it was DJ case when I defined it. But let's 
collected as U n tilde here in this truncated form, U one one to U U n n. That's a compression of U tilde. So you're first projecting on some finite subset of functions F one to F n. You act on it with a Koopman matrix. Koopman matrix is just the representation of the Koopman operator for the whole basis that extends this. And then you project back again, right? So if the subspace spanned by F1 to Fn is not invariant, you're going to project first, find the action, but that action might take you out, then you project again. So you can actually get a nonlinear representation of the Koopman operator from this matrix if you're slightly lucky. In other words, if you find a set of functions F1 to Fn, such that some of these functions in the basis depend on others. Remember the example of x, x squared, x cubed in a plane, right? So x squared and x cubed depend on x functionally. So they have the same level sets. If you find those, and if the elements in the matrix are such that the only ones that light up, in other words, the only ones that are non-zero are associated with those functions, then you just found yourself a finite dimensional nonlinear representation. But there is another point that I want to remark on. When we do applied problems, looking at the elements of the Koopman matrix is actually quite instructive. They tell you what affects what, and we have used it in practical problems a lot. So the point being that the coefficients here are very meaningful physically, as opposed to, let's say, in neural networks where you know in individual coefficients don't have much meaning. You can interpret this, and this is back to causality, right? To Perl's causality. You can interpret this coefficient basically saying, look, this is how much the, uh, the function, the observable two affects observable one. It's our standard interpretability in dynamical systems and control, nothing different, right? So um, I find that useful, but the point that I wanted to make is that by reading the elements of this matrix, you can find your nonlinear representation. There are many methodologies to do this. Uh, you know, uh, there, is, there is Cindy, there are other methodologies, but this is quite a simple one. You just take the finite section and you read off its, its coefficients. How do you obtain the coefficients UKJ? Well, the UKJ for, till, for, for the previous matrix, you can again obtain it as, as time averages, you know, provided that you're working in L2 space and provided that you're, that you're, uh, that you're, that, that your dynamics is actually ergodic, um, then you can replace the inner products that you need uh, to obtain your matrix with these sums that are again obtained from data. And, uh, and this leads to an expression that I think many of you have seen, and that's a DMD approximation. But in this interpretation, you just choose your basis vectors, your dictionary vectors, FJs. You find their duals in a finite dimensional space that, that you're looking at. And those duals are precisely associated with more penrose more penrose inverse. And so you get the more penrose inverse acting by data shifted one time um, from these really essentially time averages that you can prove exist from ergodic theory. So again, this, uh, I mean, to, to a large extent, rigorizes the, the DMD approximation, at least in the case when you have ergodicity um, for the system. All right. So uh, and let me just make sure my, uh, my time. OK, so um, let me go just a little bit further um, and say, one of my favorite methods of embedding, this is back to the thesis of Hassan Arbabi here at, uh, at, at UCSB. Uh, even from the early time, in, back in, in 2000s, uh, you know, we've used uh, time delays in the context of, uh, of uh, Koopman operator theory. So we had some results in Taken's embedding from the perspective of Koopman. But um, uh, there, is, there is a method that has been developed uh, by, by Hassan that is called that now called the Hankel DMD. And it uses this idea that if you start with an observable F and you start iterating it, so composing it with a mapping, 
uh, if you extend that to infinity, you're going to get an invariant subspace. And remember, invariant subspace is as the key to representing the operator well. If you find an invariant subspace and find a dimensional one, then you're in a good, good shape. So if you actually just use, so here is a simple insight. Take F and then take F composed with T. This is a new function. So just take it as, as, a, as a lifting function and you're getting something that as you go up with N number of snapshots, you will be coming closer to spanning an invariant subspace under certain conditions. I'll tell you that the caution needs to be exercised here. In that case, you actually get a matrix that, that is the approximate Koopman matrix or a finite section that is a companion matrix. And we know quite a bit about the companion matrix. And here's a little lemma. If the Krilov sequence satisfies that the nth iterate uh, is getting closer and closer to the span of the previous iterates, then the eigenfunction of obtained from this finite section is in the epsilon pseudo spectrum of the operator. That's nice. So if I have dynamics that is pliable, I at least know that pseudo spectrally uh, I'm converging. Uh, so that, oops. So that uh, uh, nicely, nicely holds. Uh, in particular, if you, again, expand the function in terms of eigenfunctions, you can get uh, 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 nice better results. But let me point out a, 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 some caution. It is a very simple map. Z is, again, e to the i theta, so complex. So it describes as theta varies, describes a circle. So Z prime is Z squared. This is the same as X prime is 2X mod 1. So basically, it's a, it's a, it's a measure-preserving map on a, on a circle. Here is your approximate Koopman matrix when you use the harmonic functions as, as your basis. Unfortunately, this matrix has all zeros as eigenvalues, and the mapping itself is all on the unit circle. Terrible result. What is the reason? Well, the reason is that this mapping actually has chaotic dynamics. Dynamics, as chaotic as you as you as you as you um, as you can have. It's a period. It, it's a it's a it's a doubling uh, map, and some of these types of maps, just with higher prime numbers, are actually used to generate random numbers in computers. So it's it's chaotic. Uh, in order to remedy that, uh, I, I won't speak about it today. But there is this paper in Applied Computational Harmonic Analysis with Milan Korda and, and Mihai Putinar, in which we point out how this kind of problem can be resolved. In, in other words, how you can compute the continuous part of the spectrum, because the issue here is we have continuous spectrum and, and the finite method section uh, actually fails. A just a little bit on robustness and then I'll take you through a, through a few examples. Uh, it is the finite dimensional uh, set of, finite set of, uh, modes and eigenfunctions that are used in expansion of some uh, set of variables f. And then let's take the residual stuff. So there is always some residual because we are finite dimensional, except if we are lucky and we are in the span of eigenfunctions. Let's project that back to the span of this and add noise actually to the data and see how we do it. Here is the result with 10 modes. So what I'm plotting here is the residual data and then an approximation with something like a Gaussian in this orange. So 20 modes, 50, 60. So now you're seeing that the Gaussian approximates the residual data better. And then that kind of keeps holding as you go to 90 and 100 modes. And at the 100 modes, you see almost the perfect reconstruction. The signal is, is, is blue, reconstruction is orange, and you can differentiate the signal in the reconstruction. You would say, fantastic, I've just gotten uh, my result. Uh, no, it's a terrible result. It's way overfitted. So this is joint work with Ryan Moore and Maria Fonoberova from Aimdime. Uh, it's a terrible result. The scale here is 10 to the minus five. The noise, was at the order of 0 0.1, the standard deviation. So what happened is that in this case, 
the Koopman representation was representing noise as coherent oscillations. And of course, we fitted it perfectly. You can, <laughs> with sufficient number of modes, but it's a bad result. What is in green is the standard deviation. And so the more important uh, measure is how much time does your reconstructed signal stay within the standard deviation? And that optimum is at around 60. And that's what you see here. So this is a method of dealing with robustness or, or non-robustness, if you wish, if you, if you add noise and overfitting. The control aspect of this is, uh, by the way, I should ask about time. Do I have another five minutes? Yes, um, the time is very flexible, so I, yeah. Okay, so I have a, a little bit more to say. Hopefully this is going to be interesting. Uh, the way we think about control in this context when we add the input variables is we expand the state space to include control. So we define a dynamical system where the dynamical system on the control space, let's say in the simplest case, is, is the shift. So we take control over infinite time. We take the values of control and we shift it to the left so that the input at time zero is always obtained as a shift. That's actually a dynamical system. It's an autonomous dynamical system in this representation where this part of the system is not affected by X, but U because we don't have feedback. But U here is of course an observable on this part of the system. So that's a fundamental representation here. And of course, because it's an autonomous dynamical system, there is a coupon operator for it. So there is an extended state. There is this shift operator here in discrete in the discrete time. And the space is really on that side, space of all control sequences. So you can read about this in this paper of Milan Korda and, and myself, where we coupled Koopman operator with MPC. And so now you have, if you if you if you um represent it this way, then you can say, okay, you have a variety of choices on lifting. You lift, for example, in this case we lifted on the state space with some function psi one to psi n, but we didn't lift in the control space. I know Milan is doing a lot of work with lifting on control space, but let me point out that this seems to be a novel idea in the context of control, that it's not just the inputs that are of interest, but it's also functions on the sequences of inputs that might be of interest. So there is very little work on this. Oh. Uh, there is some work, very quite practical work that we have done in which the products of inputs and states were important, but that's of course bilinear. So that's relatively standard. What I'm saying is that there is a much more general framework that says you should lift on the state space and you should lift on the control space. And then the tensor product between the functions on state space and control space is really the embedding that we should consider in general. And that I think is different and new. Um, now, if you keep with this, then you can keep a lot of the, the standard uh, DMD type approach. Without B, you would minimize the next value of observables and action of your truncated Koopman on the previous value of observables over all the possible representations of Koopman. That's, that's the standard least squares problem that, that, that the DMD algorithm, the finite section algorithm reduces to. When you have control, as, uh, as, uh, as Professor Forbes pointed out this morning, this is what, this is what it, it, it looks like. Um, and then you lift, you do pretty much the same thing. Uh, here we are. We have inverted the matrices, so we have the the y, which is the shifted space on on the left, and then more Penrose on the right. But the the strategy is very similar. And I'll show you an example of a fluid flow. This is a flow in a cavity where the lid is moved at a certain speed. Our dimension of the nonlinear system is about five thousand. Our linear predictor, well, lifted linear predictor, is dimension two hundred. There are only 40 pointwise measurements of the flow. So relatively low number of measurements, relatively low dimensional predictors, certainly an order of magnitude lower. 
And so what you want here is when the speed is high enough, if you're driving in a car with an open window, you're going to start feeling those oscillations and boom, 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 boom. You might have experienced this yourself. So what you see is that when the lid is moved at sufficient speed, you get these vorticity tracks that are floating around and you want to get rid of them by changing the motion of the, of the lid. So you can control the lid to go back and forth. And here is a little movie at the beginning. Here is what, the, what you, the controller does. Here is the kinetic energy of state error. And you see that, uh, that the control does very well in removing that red and blue vorticity. But what is interesting is that it acts in a very clever way. It acts, you see how periodically the control acts? So it only does something when the vorticity mass comes to the lid and it can counteract it. So I found that quite, uh, quite beautiful as a, as, a, as, a practical, as a practical outcome. And you're, we had some early results that maybe Peter can remember from some very, very early plenary on the control of Hamiltonian systems where I, I was trying, I was proving that in some contexts the optimal control is actually impulsive, and uh, and so then the Koopman, <laughs> the Koopman uh, controller came up with this, and I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm not sure I can prove it, you know, in this uh, in this fluid in this particular fluid context because I would need to get a handle on navier Stokes somehow. But it's certainly intriguing. So I I had fun with this, you know, 20, 20 years after the fact, I had <laughs> a little bit of fun. All right. We used it, I, I don't have much time left, but we used it in, in this interesting context of having neural networks as a dynamical system, right? You have a stochastic gradient descent and it's really a control system with, the, with, the, with data as inputs. And so you can say, well, people are doing these various types of pruning where you want to find a much smaller network that represents kind of the same result. And here are some plots. So it is the compression. 64 would mean you have 64 times less nodes in the network. And so you would like to keep compressing, but getting the accuracy very, very similar, which is something that is achieved by these top two curves. And then ResNet also with these top two curves. Both curves are obtained with a type of pruning. The first one is the famous magnitude pruning that everybody in neural networks uses. And, uh, and the second one is what we call Koopman pruning, which is, remember that G star, the time average? Um, it's just that mode that we prune based on. And so what this essentially proves, we also have an analytical proof, is that that, that type of optimal pruning is actually achieved by uh, referencing the associated coupon modes and pruning based on them. The next type of pruning that people do is gradient pruning. So it's on gradient. And that turns out to be associated with the first dissipative or first transient, the slowest transient Koopman mode. Probably in control, we would call it the sliding mode, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so interestingly, the pruning of neural networks is actually used, done using Koopman methods. It's just that they were invented in an ad hoc manner. There is quite a bit of interesting stuff to, uh, to, uh, to extend from there. You can then ask questions like, okay, well, I have two different algorithms to optimize. Are they the same? That's a question that in optimization um, people ask. The questions of whether two dynamical systems are the same in the Koopman world translate to the questions on whether the spectra of the Koopman operator are the same. And so these are well known to be the same. You can write down the conjugacy between these two systems um, by hand, but look at the plot, right? I mean, the, the Koopman is telling you almost immediately that they are they are equivalent. Uh, so it's uh, so we, what we proposed is that the distance between the spectra is a good measure of a so Wasserstein distance in particular between the spectra should be used as the measure of distance between algorithms or dynamical systems in general. Uh, this is a similar thing, and then you can even <laughs> you can even model games. So this is StarCraft game. This is a DARPA work with Aimdan, Joao, Hispania, uh, Alan Avila, and, and, and a number of people from the British Aerospace um, uh, BAE systems. So we got given a task. Uh, there is this uh, war game that is being played. And the question was model that <laughs> with Koopman. 
And so we did, uh, we, we lifted the density of Marines. These are different players, Marines, Roaches, uh, health of these units and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the question was, can you balance the game? That's an interesting question in games, right? Can you balance it so that, so that, uh, so that it gives us the right, uh, uh, the right balance? And so um, this is the pertinent plot. Here is the prediction, and here is the actual in the game. And if uh, if the prediction of the Koopman model, so we generated the Koopman model of the game and, and it just played the real game and saw whether the, the predictions of the health difference between different these different players um, uh, are similar and we got a nice diagonal plot now. Of course, the Koopman theory tells you that if you have stochasticity, for example, in initial conditions, then you're going to get the expectation correctly. So that's what comes from stochastic analysis. And you're seeing that the expectation is pretty much gotten uh, correctly, even in this very, very complex system. I promise to tell you something about uh, how efficient this is. Uh, we had a number of different um, um, simulations, complex games, large scale uh, simulation engine, medium sized simulation engine. Uh, we got training episodes of 10,000, 100,000, 5,000, 20,000. In this case, just one. And we got the speed up, uh, model speed up of, you know, 72,000. You, you see my point. Very, very large model speed up. If you compare, I, I think uh, uh, Professor Hispania, Joao Hispania uh, did some analysis of how this would be done with, um, with uh, something like reinforcement learning. And, and it's certainly orders of magnitude larger. Um, uh, larger in, 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 in effort. And the last but not least, we have a flexible arm in the lab and we wanted to control that. There are these LEDs, there are cameras on the side. They're going to watch the motion. The LEDs are going to give us the states and then we are going to lift this with time delays in this case. And I'm going to show you if this runs, exactly the learning procedure. It's sped up a little bit. The whole learning procedure is between five and 15 minutes, but we basically give it random inputs. And what it's doing now, it's learning its own abilities. It's like a baby flailing its hands, trying to figure out whether they, it can grab something. So it's essentially learning its own abilities. And then we are going to give it a task. And we're going to give it a task to follow a stick. So we're going to see this quite soon. So here it trained the Koopman model. It found the Koopman matrix, right? And the inputs here are pneumatic actuators. There, there are three or four muscles that, that are inside. And, and now we are going to give it, we're gonna pump air in and have it follow a stick. And this is what it does. Ethan Hawks, my colleague in, in the department is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, um, is the roboticist, uh, extremely well-known soft, Roboticist in the soft robotic space. So uh, he designed this experiment and this is what we got. And uh, hopefully that shows you how fast this learns um, and its ability to deal with a very complex nonlinear system, even doing constitutive models for this, for this arm, you know, with uh, even the material itself and how do you write down the fundamental physics equation is, is hardly known. Okay. So I, I went a little longer, but hopefully this was interesting. Um, um, so we talked about using Koopman operator framework in the in in the in learning, and I set it up in the theory within this theory of representations, dynamical system representations. The linear representations are those that find generalized eigenfunctions. The nonlinear representations occur when you have continuous spectrum. So um, and in that case. Um, uh, um, you can still use finite section approaches, so DMD type approaches to do this. The numerical analysis using general is a plus analysis. If you know eigenvalues, you can get eigenfunctions and modes, and then you have some rigorous methods to compute those. Um, uh, when you have finite section, you can get eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, but we need some caution with continuous spectrum. Um, I didn't describe this, but you can do numerical analysis of continuous spectrum using something that is an extension of GLA, which is Hilbert averages. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this theory uh, never uh, ceases to, to give in the sense of going back to the masters. So, you know, Hilbert, Hilbert uh, type transforms are actually useful in 
in obtaining uh, the continuous spectrum of, of, the, of the coupon operator. And I'd like to thank DARPA, AFOSR, ONR, ARO uh, specifically, and uh, the robotic arm was uh, sponsored by NSF as well. Um, uh, so thanks to all these sponsors, it's been, it's been great, um, uh, a great run. So thank you.